Shout What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to the Baseball You Podcast. We are on episode 20, and today we are joined with Logan Martin, who is a senior pitcher at the University of Kentucky. Logan, welcome to the podcast, man. Glad to be here, man. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. Drew, you want to get the ball rolling? Yeah, man. So obviously you guys can see from the thumbnail D3 to D1. That's a pretty impressive and big jump. So Heck yeah. uh, why not start us out with, uh, you know, your recruiting process in high school, kind of, you know, where you started out, like the type of offers you were getting and then uh, just kind of lead us into what uh, made made you make the decision to jump up to D1. Yeah, definitely. So out of high school, probably more got kind of a little undersized build, probably more mid 80s variety, nothing really special. We had some good off speed and command and then had a lot of kind of D3 offers. Uh, SAA was kind of the main conference where got a lot of those schools, different schools like coming in, just got Southeast Division Three region and then mm-hmm. ended up coming into Suwannee, fell in love with the place. Uh, great nice. location, good academics, mm-hmm. had baseball, was able to go in there, I think, and get a good amount of playing time. So that was always a big thing for me, just trying to get reps, trying to be seen at yeah. high school. And then kind of just went to it. Uh, but all, I still acted like it was any other program like Division Two, Division One. just kept it. With the mindset, I'm just going to get as good as I can here. I'm going to make sure doing everything I can to just get to the next level. That was always my goal. And COVID hits that first summer, of course, that first year playing at Swanee. Yeah. Kind of shut down everything. So kind of just got to go home, really got to focus kind of the weight room, got a lot bigger and stronger, especially since graduating high school. And from there, kind of went into my sophomore year ready, had a pretty good year, but kind of COVID kind of limited our game plays. Uh, didn't really want to do the switch division one too early. I uh, wanted to be really loyal, just really loyal to Swanee. Wanted to be there at least with my first draft year. Wanted to make sure I could at least give it a shot so mm-hmm. I can get drafted out of there. And then my uh, ended up, I was in the portal my sophomore and junior year, and I got an offer to go play at Kentucky that, that junior year for me. And that was always like almost like a homecoming. Grew up a big UK fan, yeah. always a big Wildcat fan. That's for awesome, basketball, dude. For sure. And then uh, so that was I met all the coaches, great people, great place, honestly. And then Finished out my last year at Sewanee, my junior season, had a had a good individual season, and then decided just, I think, Kentucky's the best option. That's why I'm here now. That's sweet. So when you say you entered the transfer portal, kind of what was that? Take someone who doesn't know exactly what that is, kind of take us through that process of what that was like for you. Yeah, so I entered the portal my sophomore summer. So that was about May before I started Coastal Plain League. I was playing down in Carolina and Asheboro. And so I entered the portal kind of that year, pretty much just opened up any school to contact me legally without kind of breaking any kind of rules with conduct and that kind of stuff. So I was able to kind of get my stock even kind of for that going into my junior year. Mm-hmm. And they got some good, got a good amount of schools. They had some interest in me. A lot of them wanted me to transfer early. And I was pretty much set on doing a grad school transfer out of Suwannee and that didn't really buy on anything. Nothing felt really, I didn't feel convicted at all on any of the offers at hand. Yeah. I went into my junior fall and at uh, Suwannee. Kind of the same thing. A couple of schools reaching out, but not as much in the fall ball. And then kind of that midterm, kind of got some looks from Kentucky. They uh, kind of, I reached out to them through an email, actually. Kind of just sent okay. it out. Yeah, I probably, I honestly, I, I would just send out like hundreds of emails, just different schools saying, hey, I'm a pitcher looking to get grad school offers, looking to get some time at your program. And uh, they got back to me really quickly in about December, January. And we kind of make it official then. That's awesome. No, dude, that's sweet. So, um, obviously like being in the portal has got to be stressful, right? Like just having your name in there and you're kind of like sitting there waiting, like, okay, like give us some insight. Like, were you ever like my career is riding on somebody giving me a chance? Can you talk to us a little bit about that? No, yeah, definitely. I mean, for me, it's like, I always had a great relationship with my coaches at Suwannee. So they were all for me trying to look into graduate school offers. And then I know when Kentucky came on with an undergraduate offer for senior year for me, it was that was kind of a no brainer, but it was more stressful just trying to see like what my stock was, I think, and seeing like, man, am I really as good as these other guys that are playing at these schools? And it was kind of just uh, trying not to be overwhelmed at it, because I think at times I definitely took it. I took too much effort into it. I definitely tried too hard to like, kind of respond and everything. But I think it's like I think as long as just like just doing your job outside of I think the emails, kind of just making sure you're still working hard, still throwing and just not stressing it too much. Yeah. 
Yeah. So when people look at the difference between Division Three and Division One, a lot of things that they notice is the velocity, especially being a pitcher. So kind of take us through a little bit. Did you have that big velocity jump that kind of put you at the next level through COVID, or was it kind of just your overall pitching and game and things like that, rather than just a increase in velocity? Yeah, I would say it's a little bit of both. Definitely more of a gradual velocity increase. Like my senior summer, I think I hit 87, 88 maybe, but kind of just kind of sitting in that mid-80s and then – uh, freshman year at Sewanee hit 89 and then had a pretty good velo jump that COVID COVID summer kind of fall hit 93 my sophomore year that was kind of a big jump and then I had that going in the coastal plain kept that mm-hmm. velo pretty consistent and then my junior year at Sewanee I was pretty much about 90 94 every game kind Jeez. of send that send that range wow yeah. so it was honestly just being older and just kind of just learning command learning pitchability like knowing like what what to throw guys what to throw a big three hole variety just like, I kind of just like learning the game as a go. So yeah. definitely going to division one, I think having the three years of experience at Sewanee, of course, I think that definitely helped out just, just getting, just getting looks, just really getting reps yeah. and just having like the innings amount that I was able to get the past three years. I gotcha. So obviously we touched on the velocity being a big indicator for pitchers, the difference between division three, division two and division one. Um, what would you say the difference is like on the other side of the plate, like you're facing these hitters, what, what would you say is like the determining factor? Like, Obviously, Division three hitters are still very good baseball players and very good hitters in their own right. But what's the difference, really, between having a D3 guy in the box versus a D1 guy in the box? No, yeah, definitely. And we faced some good teams last year. I know like, we faced, like, Marietta College, Birmingham Southern. We faced uh, them, too. Wallace. We faced yeah. Marietta. That was bad. That was yeah, really I, bad. I threw against <laughs> them. We played down in uh, – I can't think of the town in Florida, but we had a spring break trip there, and I pitched against them. Okay. And, like, it was – that was probably the best team I think you ever facing a D3 because it was, like – Yeah, they were good. That, it's they like were, they they don't really make mistakes. It's like if you made a mistake, like they took advantage of it. Oh yeah, and it was kind of just living in that because we should have won that game, but made too many mistakes really. But it's like facing a team like that. It's like they're one to nine, which is pretty solid. Yeah, and it's like if you take their top three to four guys, it's like that could be a probably a typical kind of D one guy. But it's just these D one lineups. They have one to nine is like your best D three hitter. That's yeah. probably I think the best way to kind of translate it because even at Solana, okay. we had some great players that came through. And like those are be those are like one to three guys, and yeah. so to take those one to three guys, and they could probably play on a lot of li- like different like low mid like major rosters. Yeah, you want. that's crazy seeing yeah. the difference between because I mean we played Marietta and that was bad. It's like yeah. if you make one mistake pitch, they kind of make you pay for that. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So pitching at Kentucky, uh, you've obviously said. You know, the difference, the hitters are obviously more advanced. What adjustments have you had to make off the mound to, you know, combat those Division One hitters? Yeah. I've always definitely had good stuff, I think, good feel. And it's more just making sure every little thing is succinct. Every little thing is very, uh, like, very little room for error, I think. Mm-hmm. Making sure you're not trying to overdo anything or be perfect, but you're just trying to make sure everything, like the motion is very fluid, very repeatable. And when you start, like, doing unrepeatable stuff, that's when stuff gets left over the plate. That's when you kind of start, like, it's like aim small, miss small. That's yeah. kind of, I think, the biggest thing I think I had to adjust with, with D, but definitely with D1. And then with the fastball itself, like, knowing, like, the fastball spots, like, which zones are going to be, like, with the T zone, like, knowing, like, up and in, up and away, not staying middle low. It's just kind of knowing, like, percentage-wise and statistics, like, what works and what doesn't, I think. Yeah. Gotcha. So, at Kentucky and even at Suwannee, did you guys – place a big emphasis on those statistics like you touched on like would you have like pre-pitchers meetings like say before a start would you like get like scouting reports basically and all that stuff yeah it definitely at both schools too at kentucky of course there's more technology there's definitely much more analytics going into it so there's much more involvement there with like okay this guy we have all these numbers on him whereas with a lot of d3s and you guys probably know it as well it's like there may not be like that much data out there to be mm-hmm. able to get so for us, it was mainly with D3 kind of looking at like the percentages of like bunting attempts, percentages yeah. of like what this guy kind of like, is he hit away side? Is he a full side? <clears throat> Whereas with division one, I feel like we do a lot more data and these hit like the pre-meetings and prep with like the location spots themselves, not like where the ball is actually hit at. But okay, this guy will swing a lot at like low and away. Whereas yeah. the D3, it's like, okay, he's hitting the ball away. But like, and it's just kind of like trying to like take that away from him instead. Yeah. So change topics a little bit. If you were to take the top five D3 teams like Marietta, Baldwin, Wallace, those kind of teams versus, you know, not the bottom feeder, but pretty much bottom five D1 teams, who do you think would win? I mean, I would go with D3 just because like, because we even faced, like we faced one of their, 
probably like I can't. It was like so about about a year ago actually. And mm-hmm. I remember we faced probably their three or four guy from Marietta, and then they threw in one of their all region relievers. And uh, oh, even we the, saw him. T- yeah, that's kind of like, like, like a little side armor guy, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So like you put him at any level, he's going to compete. And mm-hmm. like they have at least I would say they have five to six hitters that were a pretty high level of baseball. And yeah. that's a program that like that's a real well coached program, a well like very high athletic level with a lot of emphasis. Mm-hmm. And if you gave them a Division One budget, they may already even have them too. I mean, if you gave them like uh, even a better budget, even more emphasis on that, like more time to training in the fall, because I know D three limits pretty bad on the yeah. amount of time. Yeah. In the fall. So I think if you make the playing field even, I think they're going to take that series anytime. Interesting. Yeah. Love to hear I it. Gotcha. What Love do you guys? I, I never, I, I never thought about it like that. I, I would agree with you. I would, I would say if you give like those teams like Baldwin Wallace, yeah. you know Marietta, uh, if you give those guys Division One budgets, Division One time, Division One coaching, Division One facilities. I mean, baseball players are baseball players, and you know more than anybody else. Like the game, the game can change like that. The game changes yeah, after exactly. the first pitch. So if you if you give these guys Division One amenities, like they're still baseball players, they're still going to go out there and compete. So I, I agree with you. I think and Division even, Three guys and like take their that. head coach, he's a great guy. I've heard great things about him, and they may even have great facilities too. But just having that more team time together, yeah. He's, I, he's our fall ball at Swan. I think we had. It was roughly like a four week, four day a week period where at Kentucky it was like a six day a week, seven, like seven week period. Yeah. So it's like you have so much more time together to really work on the small things and the little things. Absolutely. I think just having more time for that. And like you don't know how some kids are going to do like with alone time. Mm-hmm. So I think some guys, they only get four days a week in practice. They may not be working those extra three days and stuff. Yeah. I gotcha. So back to back to Kentucky a little bit, you know, coming from Sewanee, first day on campus, day one, you know new kid on the block. What was that culture shock like just showing up and looking around and being like, wow, I'm actually at Kentucky. Yeah, it was, it was definitely surreal. I know our first, even our first fall game too, kind of just like, just taking it all in really, Mm -hmm. but a very opposite from Suwannee with like, it was a downtown scene, very like larger town and with Lexington being Mm -hmm. a great area as it is. And then it was, I never felt too overwhelmed. It was kind of just something I knew I would have to adjust to sometime in life, just kind of getting on from Suwannee. So, but I mean, I looked forward every day. Like I really enjoyed being at the field and not really taking it, like not trying to act cocky at all. I'm not saying, yeah, I'm some all this D1 guy now. Yeah. Pretty much just always doing it. It's like having that chip really and just still, mm-hmm. and just continuing practicing and working out and just performing kind of with that chip on the shoulder. No, that's awesome to hear. Um, what would be your advice to someone who is playing either at a JUCO or at a D3 who's trying to transfer to, you know, a move up in the division? Um and transfer to like a four year if you were at a JUCO. Yeah. So uh, I don't know as much about JUCO route with like how their portal works and stuff. But mm-hmm. for me, like I got really, I would call it even some lucky with like just emailing and just like reaching yeah. out to stuff. Cause like I remember my sophomore fall, I think I sent like 30 emails out to like Coastal Plain, Cape Cod, mm-hmm. North, all these different leagues. I got one offer back and like that one offer got me so much. Led like, to, yeah. Yeah. It led, led to innings. It led to like just like, just it pretty much it led to Kentucky knowing who I was yeah. and just having just like just really putting yourself out there and just like like with Twitter now how it is where like you can post a video you can share wherever you can have people share it for you and just like just getting yourself out there yeah and just not like just not treating it where like you're gonna let them come to me because if you let that happen you're only gonna get a small portion like you're not you're not like you're limiting yourself yeah when you're not like putting yourself out there and then gotcha. with like I think just working just like. Not mm-hmm. really focusing on where you're at now, but really just focusing on like what the end game is, and like, cause, like okay. guys get drafted from D three and D and JUCO all the time. It's just like, but like it's just guys who work and put in the put in the effort. Gotcha. I like that. So, so kind of kind of flipping that a little bit. You know, you're sitting here at Kentucky D one. If you right now mm-hmm. could send a message to your 18 year old self, what is the most important thing you wish you could have told your 18 year old self? Uh, definitely don't get caught up and always just stay on, stay on the route. And just cause like, is I, I never knew, like, I thought I was going to be with a swine degree after four years. And that, okay. just like, I would never would have thought I would have been at the university of Kentucky, definitely out of high school. For mm-hmm. sure. yeah. I just never thought I'd be at that level. And it's kind of just a dream come true, really being at the school that I kind of grew up a fan of always just wearing like the gear in high school and pretty much just like always making sure I'm putting in a hundred percent effort every day, even with the small thing, just like just learning and just adapting. And just knowing that, like, I, I'm going to get stuff in life. You just got to work around it. 
We just got to keep pushing. Yeah, I think it's cool how you, obviously, um, coming out of high school, you didn't have, a lot of people have like, okay, I'm going to go D1, I'm not going to play at all. It's kind of cool how you saw, like, the long-term thing. So talk about, obviously, that had to be pretty humbling, knowing that, okay, maybe I'm not going to go Division One or even Division Two. I'm going to go to a smaller school, I'm going to work my ass off, and then, you know, maybe in the future I'll get success from that. Kind of talk about how, that process kind of changed you. Cause I know it's a lot when you realize that, Oh, maybe I'm not there yet to play at that upper division. So yeah. I'll just go here, grind. And then maybe I'll get there. Yeah. And I never thought about transferring to division one out of Sewanee, honestly, three years ago, like I would never have thought of that, but I always just, I think set very high goals that probably seemed unattainable too. I always like, I remember like writing down in journals and back when I was like 17, 18 high school, senior, freshman year at Sewanee. I remember writing down, like, I'm going to be an All-American by this year. I'm going to be an All-Region guy by this year. And it was just like just pushing myself when no one really pushed me, I think. And almost like doing it like for me, by me. Just like kind of that kind of like mindset, I think. And just uh, with just the tra- – like with the transferring and like with the potential to go be in the draft, I always want to be the first guy from Sewanee drafted because ha- they've never had a guy drafted. So that was yeah. like – that was my goal going there. It was like I'm going to be that guy that like puts the school on the map. That kind of mindset. Just say I'm just great. always pushing myself and just making sure I was just doing the right things in the right time. Mm-hmm. No, that's sweet. Yes. I mean, I love and it. like LJ touched on it, like a lot of a lot of guys coming out of high school, you know, with with the potential and you know, higher floors, naturally higher ceilings of, you know, I'm gonna go division one or bust, but a lot of those guys just may not realize, like, hey, let me go develop, kind of like you and LJ touched on. Let me go develop here. Yeah, let me work here. And then it comes to fruition. Like you said, you're, it sounds like you're at your dream school. No, it's been great so far. I couldn't ask for anything better. And then I think like, too, like I, I've heard so many stories of like guys going D1, D2, and then having to go to Juco, then another school. And it's just like, it's a tough route. And like, it's a, like, especially with how the world is now with baseball, like everybody's doing grad transfers and like Juco and yeah. like D1 to D1, D2 to D1. It's like <laughs> the, the portal is just crazy now with like, what's all like how much disability there is in talent level. So I think the best thing is just going somewhere that you know you're going to play. And like, cause I knew out of high school, I was going to be a pretty good, I think, inning getter at Swan. And I knew that for me was like, I can do that. I can play a lot here. I can get my name out there. That was probably the biggest reason why I went there. Nice. Gotcha. Nice. Yeah, that's that's so cool. Just going, <clears throat> especially like you said, being the first player to get drafted. That's pretty, pretty cool that you had that goal, you know, going in there. Because, I mean, that'll light a fire under your butt for however long. Because, you know, it, it's definitely a grind. Um. This is my last question, and then Drew will ask the final question to wrap it up. So you touched on it a little bit, but you said you used to journal when you were, like, in high school and stuff. And me and Drew both, like, really studied the mental part of the game because I think it's very – it's not talked about it. It's not talked about as, as much as I think it should be. And it's definitely – baseball is one of those games where so – like, 90% of it's mental. If you don't have the mental, you're, you're never going to go anywhere. So talk about how – have you done anything to increase your mental part of the game and take us kind of through that journey? Yeah, definitely. I've probably even done too much, honestly, almost like become a psychotic. <laughs> nice. Wait, on the mat, <laughs> it's that kind of I stuff. I love that. Really. <laughs> but uh, no, I mean, I think uh, even just like freshman year of even now, kind of restarting really doing it, like just even like small, like nutritional guide, throwing guide, yeah. just like just daily workout metrics and like what I did and like how I felt and just different stuff along the process. And I think with the mental game and kind of like the pregame and like the days before, I always like, I would use music kind of just like, just really okay. like visualizing, just like, just like I was laying in bed late at night, but I was just kind of like walking around, just like visualizing pitching and mm-hmm. just really like associating that with music and just having that really okay. Like That's I'm cool. just going to visualize success. Pretty much That's cool. I like that. Yeah. Do you do any meditation or anything? Uh, I'll do like, not really meditate. I'll do like a kind of just yoga and stretching with music and just having like just the mind flowing. Yeah, yeah. Just, think, just thinking of success, really, as much as I can. That's awesome. I like that. I gotcha. So, all right. Million dollar question. Here we go. All right. Top five sunflower seeds. Give them to us. Five to one. Wait, top five. What is it again? Sorry. Sunflower seeds. Sunflower seeds. Five being the, well, See, not it's the worst, be bad. But... I'm really not too cultured on sunflower seeds that much, but I knew, like, I remember growing up, I was a huge, number one, I'd say ranch, honestly. And number one, one ranch and number one, yeah. I've always right. been a ranch, okay. All right, always a different taste. Uh, you, you two, can't hate on ranch. What even are all the flavors so like barbecue, bacon? That's like sizzling bacon, right? 
Yeah, yeah. sizzling bacon. You got dill pickle, taco supreme, Not sweet and salty, it. sweet and spicy. Anything okay. that you can think of that's okay, a condiment, two, it's a sunflower yeah. seed flavor. <laughs> Pretty much right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, one ranch, two taco supreme. Definitely good. Okay. And then I'm I'm all for original too. Keep it just very yes. easy. Yes. Do that, really? The original yes. Okay, I like that. <laughs> Dill yes. pickle, I can't put in there. Uh, huh. I think a barbecue is four. Okay, it's respectable. Five. I just don't know all the flavor. If I had like a list written down, I could definitely give a better answer. But I think you ever tried crack, cracked pepper Old Bay? Ever tried any of those? Cracked pepper, five. Cracked pepper. Okay. Cracked. So pepper, uh, barbecue, original, uh, taco supreme, and then ranch. Go with nice. I like it. That's a respectable list. I can get yeah. behind that. I do. I, I like I, are you for? I like that. Do you have any any other advice you want to give before Santa wraps us up here? No, yeah, definitely. No, thanks for having me on again. But uh, always just I think I mean I t- definitely took a road less travel and I definitely like now I would never think I'd be I'd, I'd be in the situation four years ago. And always just knowing that like if you put in your work and you put in like just the effort and the time into it, a lot of times it's gonna be very successful with anything yeah. really in life. Yeah. I gotcha. Love well, all right, it. guys, that is going to do it for episode 20, 2 0. Shout yes, out to sir. <laughs> of go. baseball, you. Uh, thank you to our guy Logan for coming on here and uh, dropping some knowledge bombs for us. Thank watch you him so on, much for coming on. Uh, watch him on ESPN. Can I yeah. Watch 17. the kid on ESPN. Yeah. There we go. But all right, guys, that's going to wrap it up. Logan, thank you again for coming on. We had a blast. It was Same super here. fun getting to pick yeah. your brain on all this stuff. And like you said yourself, a road less traveled. So thank you for dropping some knowledge bombs on here for us. Anytime. Thanks for having me. Of course. All right. We'll see you guys. All right. Peace.